Welcome everyone. Today is Thursday, September 8th. Uh, today's our community call where we are going to be featuring uh, a few special guests all coming to us from the uh, from the OPSI crew. Uh, but before I pass it off to Shadi and crew, uh, I did just want to do uh, mention a couple broad things. Um, so uh, yeah, media, if anyone sees media communication and wonder who that is, that is good old Shadi El Damani who will be presenting on OPSI uh, is a is a DSI steward and a bunch of uh, and a neuroscientist, hence the uh, the specific background image of choice. I'm assuming. Um, but yeah, before we dive into the uh, kind of the presentation and uh, hearing from uh, the the upside team, did just want to mention a couple of things as reminders and see if there's uh, anyone else who wants to shout anything out uh, in terms of events coming up. I will just say again for anyone in the SCRF community who is in the New York area around SmartCon, September 28th, 29th, that's Chainlink's kind of annual major conference that they put on. Uh, if you are both in New York there and you would like a ticket to the conference, I think we can still get a couple more. Uh, so please DM me if you are interested. Uh, Shadi and I will actually be on a panel together on DSI. Um, and I, I think at least some folks from the DSI Labs crew uh, will have Sina there as well and still trying to iron out who else will uh, will be on that panel with us. Um, but yeah, that's one thing that's coming up. And I guess just uh, if we're on the, the note of uh, shameless event plugs, DSI Boston is coming up. That's going to be, I believe, Sunday the 18th, if I'm remembering my dates correctly. Um, so yeah, that's another thing that's coming up. Uh, in terms of scurf specific activities, uh, next week in our community call, uh, we will be, oh, right, we're going to be talking all things merge uh, and getting into uh, one specific uh, research summary that's supposed to hit our forum next week. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And uh, yeah, really excited for that conversation. And then the week after that, we're most likely going to do some project management updates for our community and team. And then we'll get back to uh, possibly having uh, Otterberg and some other folks from the Proposal Inverter crew for that last Thursday in September. So excited for our slate of activities that we got uh, planned for the community call throughout the month of September. Uh, Brian, anyone else on our side have any other kind of calls or guilds uh, that you want to plug to the uh, wider public community? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Tomorrow we have the Source Cred Guild, which is at 10 a.m. Pacific time. That occurs on the second Friday of every month. I'm actually calculating the payouts right now, so we'll have those going out soon. They were delayed this month due to the holiday. And I also have today, later today, an analytics guild where we basically talk about how we track activity across all of the SCURF platforms and different places that we have hosted spaces on the internet. So if you're an analytics person and would like to part, uh, join in on that, I can get you a link to it, but uh, let me... Oh, it's not on the public calendar right now, but let me just find the time for that. Here we go. It's at noon Pacific time today. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. Does anyone else then, intern? Oh, please, John. Yep. The the coffee house is right after this on Discord, 1 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be talking about NFT, um, basically the NFTs and the, the flaws with them, potential flaws. There was a piece of research posted discovered recently called NFT wash trading, quantifying suspicious behavior. Uh, in NFT markets, that's very interesting. So we'll use that to inform the discussion. But again, anyone's welcome to join whether or not you've read this thing and we'll just talk about NFTs. And then the discussion that we had two or three weeks ago with Martin and Zonka from Blockchains for Science has been posted on YouTube. Uh, Ivan and Michael made this thing look very pretty. So go check it out, it's fantastic. And it was a very lively discussion. If you have any interest in DSI at all, uh, it's a discussion among people who have been in the space for a very long time, just talking about how to make science better. Uh, so hope to see everyone at the uh, coffee house right after this on Discord. Awesome, thank you, John. Anyone else internally at Scurf have any anything else to plug? Umar, I see you hopped off mute. I'm just going to plug our reading group for the Infinite Machine coming up on September 19th, Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll be going over the first half of the book, so uh, yeah, please uh, grab the book and read it and come to the sesh. Should be fun. Awesome, thank you. Any other uh, SCURF community things going on, Paul? Yep, uh, so I am uh, excited to announce that we are doing a cohort uh, writing group with 
um, Taptive, and we're going to have basically a um, open call for people who would like to work on some of their writing, particularly comment writing on the forum. So helping us move those discussions towards actionable and productive or raising question types of ends. Um, and this is a kind of free to you service. Uh, I will drop a link in the chat. Um, this will basically be a four week program where you'll get peer review, or like not kind of academic peer review, but reviewed by your peers uh, in your cohort uh, so that uh, your writing quality will be improving um, over that period of time and also engaging in some really good discussions on the forum. Um, so the sign up and more information is now in the chat and then you'll see more information about this uh, on the Discord all throughout uh, the next two weeks. Awesome, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, really excited to see that come together and a, and a shout out to uh, Nick Link, on, a, on the, who's a SCRF contributor as well as supporting some other projects generally. Uh, but yeah, Nick was the one who made an introduction to CityDAO that led to the Taptive connection. So thank you for that, Nick. And yeah, really excited for this cohort to kick off. Uh, and we're most likely going to run a second iteration of it around November-ish with CityDAO. And that'll be kind of a partnered one like that. Uh, Michael, do you want to jump in real quick? Yeah, I just wanted to do one quick plug. Um, I'd mentioned this um, in some previous meetings, but the Research Pulse newsletter, um, uh, we did a soft launch of that for the SCRF community um, this week. Um, for people who don't know, that uh, aggregates some of the most recent research in the Web3 space. And uh, traditionally, we've shared it as a weekly socials feature, and we're migrating that to a, an e-newsletter. So that's available. Um, if you're interested in subscribing, we'd love for, for as many people to subscribe as possible, share your feedback. Um, it's available via Substack and via Mirror, and I'll drop both of those links in the chat here um, to sh that you can go to to subscribe. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else on the SCURF side? I think that covers all of our active things for this week on in the next week. So just before I quickly hand it off to Shadi, I know there's also, and given that we're on the topic of DSI and everything, uh, I do want to quickly give a chance to uh, Eric and or John to quickly plug the DSI Labs monthly uh, DSI seminars, uh, Future of Science seminars that are getting kicked off. I saw announcements kind of popping up in a few places, and I know y'all are both here. So I, I figured I'll quickly give y'all a chance to uh, plug another great DSI activity uh, before we pass off the reins to a wonderful DSI project. Yeah, Eric, absolutely. all you. Thanks, Eugene. Much appreciated. So a couple different quick plugs from DSI Labs. First off, we've got the Future of Science seminars coming up, which are a series of talks with experts in the space around the back end of science, peer review, meta science, anything in that realm. Um, going to be a great conversation. It's open to anyone. So if you go on the DSI Foundation or DSI Labs Twitter, you can find a link. I'll post it on the in-call messages. Um, also wanted to quickly plug our latest product update, which is function calls as citations permanently and immutably linked on chain. So through DSI nodes, somebody can add a code component to a research object. And anytime another person wants to call that function, that gets counted as a citation in the DSI system. I know that's a lot, so I'll post a Twitter thread that explains a little bit more. But yeah, thanks, Eugene. And I'm excited to hear what Chatty has to say. Yeah, of course. And so, yeah, with that, if anyone else does have anything else, any other wider community, DSI, Web3, whatever, please feel free to drop that in the chat. Uh, but to be respectful of the OPSI team's time, I, I definitely want to hand it off to Shadi. Are you going to be the first one jumping in and introducing yourself and the rest of the team? Uh, or I see a, a bunch of folks from the team are on, so I don't know if Nanak or anyone else wants to hop in uh, and kind of kick things off. Yeah, I think I can um, maybe jump in really quick, uh, give you guys a quick uh, overview on OPSI and kind of set the stage for the conversation uh, uh, where Anonymous will take over and kind of give us a nice deep dive into Holonym, uh, which is a zero knowledge identity substrate for privacy in Web3 that had its origins in DSI and is now kind of diving deep into how we think about identity and privacy. Uh, with things like tornado cash and uh, government IDs, real ID kind of hitting uh, hitting hitting deployment. Uh, so identity's been on the mind for a little bit here. Let me uh, just pull up these slides here for you guys. One sec. Um, there we go. 
Yeah, so I just kind of wanted to take some time to share a little bit about OPSI. I think this is the first time I've uh, been to these community calls, so thank you for having me. Uh, this is such a great space to see so many familiar faces. Uh, I think today we also have joining us uh, Caleb, uh, who's a dev uh, OPSI and working uh, on Holland and now full time. Uh, Chen Mu Chang, who's our uh, cryptography advisor and professor, I think, at the University of uh, the University in Japan. Um, we have Chris Tom, who's from uh, BTQ, uh, which is a company that's also working and collaborating with us to build post-quantum resistance into some of the technology that we're developing for identity uh, on chain. And so definitely uh, you can pose your questions to those two. They'll have lots to say. We also have uh, Nanak, of course, with us, uh, and Laura Hack, who's one of the uh, co-founding executives of uh, ORCID, which we've taken a lot of inspiration from when thinking about public goods and interoperability uh, and scientific and, and how we kind of build for reproducibility, starting with persistent identifiers for scientists first. So yeah, so with that said, um, perhaps I can just really quickly dive into this and kind of give you guys an overview. So uh, OPSI, uh, short for Open Science or Opsensia, uh, if, if uh, that also suits your fancy, fancy and you like some Latin. And uh, over the past year, we've been really focusing on building, at first, what we call the DSI stack. So we started kind of thinking and envisioning uh, what are the different components or modular building blocks that we'll need to build self-sufficient knowledge creation and discovery communities that are web native, uh, that have their own kind of internal uh, mechanisms for coordination, for incentive alignment, uh, and, and most importantly, that's actually perform more effectively, more efficiently than actually do reproducible research and innovate more quickly and more um, significantly than perhaps the existing status quo of how we think about uh, software and science today. So yes, uh, I think it's important to kind of take a step back and think about what uh, DSI is and why it's important. You know, we're here today because we're all kind of mostly interested in, in Ethereum or smart contract technology for solving key issues with either in computer science uh, uh, regarding deterministic compute, or we're interested in you know things like um, building DAOs, for example, that allow people to come together, uh, delegate trust to code, and to be able to perform tasks that normally weren't available uh, or you know had to require extensive human human human. Um, oversight. And so, you know, with DSI, there's this promise of automation, right, where we can build these protocols or services that allow us to deploy, uh, deploy these scientific applications on internet protocols that aren't owned by one individual big tech company or one giant, uh, you know, one publishing giant or one um, monopolistic institution. They really are kind of autonomous that they run of their own accord on decentralized internet software. Anyone who runs a node can can, can can support the network and most importantly that it's community owned right like the, the direction is driven by the individuals that are uh incentivized or, or or stakeholders in the community right so i don't want to take too much time to to, to to dive into that but more than happy to kind of um dive more into what makes DSI special and why it distinguishes itself from the open science uh, kind of movement so far and how it fits into that overarching narrative so at a quick glance um OPSI, we've been starting, I think, in uh, last November or October, we started collecting demographics on all new entries into, uh, in, in, into our community. And this is kind of uh, our way of trying to understand what's the persona or typical type of person that comes in, into the DSI space, right? So uh, we've kind of categorized them into six you know, distinct kind of uh, personas, which are investigators. These are people that are actively doing research, either at an institution, at a, in, an industry, or independently. Uh, hackers, so these are folks that are coming from either a hackathon, uh, either in neuroscience or Web3, and uh, are looking for challenging uh, open source contributions to be making. Uh, coordinators, so these are individuals that are really interested in kind of community and, 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 and building. Uh, and I'm listing them off in, in, in kind of the proportion of, of, of of membership that we have within these different categories. Uh, curators, so these are folks that are you know, posting articles or synthesizing knowledge. Uh, communicators are those that are communicating that knowledge. And uh, artists, of course, right? those that perform graphics or uh, um, that are interested in perhaps the more artistic components of scientific uh, research and community. So our kind of main, I think, uh, value add or focus to the design movement has been focusing specifically on 
data uh, and, in, and being able to let data or being able to empower, um, I'm sorry, empowering researchers to be able to share data more easily without relying on third party server infrastructure. So that was kind of one of our first, one of our first hackathon projects where we were uh, looking to see if we could add IPFS support to an existing metadata index called Datalad. Uh, and the, so this index basically is this distributed index that runs on Git Annex, which is a special kind of uh, use case, or I guess a special kind of set of libraries that allow you to version control binary files instead of code, right? Code has lines. And so usually when you version code, kind of you know how you treat those objects and how you can parse information is a little bit different than a binary file, right? Which might be like a, an image or you know um, maybe like you know some sort of scientific data or object or proprietary format of that sort. So, so data lab is really fascinating because it has this kind of distributed archive and anyone anywhere can uh, upload data and post it to the, to, to the archive. However, data often falls off that index because you know, there's no kind of guarantee of persistent storage there. So what we've done is uh, gone through and built some infrastructure to uh, scrape that data off of data lab, archive it on Filecoin, pin it on IPFS. Uh, and we have some automated pipelines that uh, kind of facilitate that process. And we've been crawling through that 500 terabyte index and putting that on commons.offside.io. Uh, right now, there's about 700 members that have uh, signed up uh, and completed some of these uh, surveys. Uh, so we're not, not a very huge community, but we're, we're a significant community. And uh, we draw a, quite a range of expertise. Um, so you know, key to, I think, uh, some of the activities that we've been doing at Opsi is really kind of academic research as well, right? Thinking about where uh, the cutting edge of neuroscience, because that's you know what the majority of our backgrounds are, and computer science, artificial intelligence, relates to system design and DAOs specifically. And this was the very first collaborative research project that we did with the Active Inference Institute, uh, which is uh, a completely web-native organization. Uh, and they've been on, on, on the community calls before, and that's actively researching active inference, which is a subfield of uh, the free energy theory of consciousness or, or cognitive, um, cognitive, cognitive phenomenon. And active inference is really, really kind of important because it's an elaboration, if you're familiar with uh, the machine learning or artificial intelligence literature, of the partially observable Markov decision process. Uh, it allows us to kind of start thinking about sense states as separate from action states and intermediated by internal states that all have mathematical formulations and can be really nicely projected onto systems in the brain that we can test, manipulate, and, and, and be able to prove hypotheses about. So what's interesting about this is that active inference has kind of similar themes as thinking about uh, how individuals make sense in distributed systems and how we can actually come to an understanding and select actions, for example, uh, as a thinking about a DAO as a cognitive system. And there's a, a, a plug I'd like to make for active inference. They'll be talking about cognitive systems and why we need them in Web3, I think in a week or two on September 14th, I believe. Uh, so do, do look out for them on Twitter and, and join that conversation if this is interesting to you. Uh, another thing I'd like to kind of plug in there is a key output of this research was this active entity ontology for science. So it's really important, I think, to have a shared language, specifically when we're thinking about writing smart contracts that facilitate different processes or functions within decentralized autonomous organizations, specifically for science, right? Specifically, specifically for DSI. So this active ent entity ontology lets us kind of uh, simulate complex behavior uh, that might be instantiated in smart contracts by having kind of the shared language that we can use to, uh, to model different agents and their interactions together. So some examples are like, for example, um, say a team publishes a knowledge artifact, and these are all tokens taken from ontology, these individual words. Uh, say this knowledge artifact is specifically a grant, and then request funding from a DAO, which signs the license of the grant. So then you can kind of uh, simulate over many epochs or times how, for example, that DAO or that team might use the funding or how the treasury evolves over time. So I wanted to kind of uh, move the discussion a little bit further towards what Opsi is building uh, and kind of set the stage for Nanak uh, to dive a little bit deeper into Holonym. So, you know, we're primarily focused with uh, DSI primitives, spe specifically in the area of coordination, publishing, and um, community. So some of the projects that we've really been focusing on are uh, identity systems for DSI and also beyond, right? I think general identity systems are uh, something that's a really hot topic in Web3. and Specifically for DSI, I think you know it was really quickly converged upon that reputation and credentials are the currency of the realm when it comes to science, and uh, we won't be able to have a really kind of captivating 
or impactful DeSci movement without being able to verify identities and prove things about uh, intellectual ownership, contribution, and whatnot. And as you'll see, I think they'll form a key component of how we think about uh, maybe this next generation of uh, how we can use NFTs or variations of NFTs called impact certificates to be able to fund very detailed types of impact within the DeSci space. Um, so before I do jump ahead, uh, if you haven't, do check out verse.offsci.io, it's our decentralized science identity registry. Uh, if you're a scientist, you can go on there, log in, attach, uh, link your, your ORCID and your GitHub or your other credentials on chain, and that includes you in this uh, registry of scientists that could be parsed by other uh, decide apps uh, for different purposes like permissionless publishing or um, uh, you know, PO apps for being a scientist, right, and, and some other cool nifty stuff. Uh, so I'll, let, I'll definitely I'll not get into the details with Holonym. I also wanted to point your attention to some of the work that we've done uh, thinking about decentralized science fellowships. I know that this work really runs in parallel to stuff that Scrip is doing, thinking about how do we build research networks. And so, you know, I think it's totally possible to pull up, put up a, a fellowship program that incentivizes people to submit high quality proposals that are peer reviewed on the community, uh, just using GitHub and successful, you know, thinking about how we can use things like a pull request, right, to automate a lot of these uh, ways of allocating funds to researchers. We've had some really great outcomes, folks, you know, developing research, uh, developing uh, uh, code, uh, to doing primary research, uh, and, and actually releasing products. And lastly, we, I spoke a little bit about the uh, data commons and how important it is to, I think, um, you know, if, if science really is going to move towards Web3, what is the actual value add? And uh, interoperable data and having verifiable compute, verifiable storage, verifiable access to persistent identifiers is going to be really at the heart of that. And so, you know, we're really excited to build this out and spe specifically build on top of products like DSight and other DSight Labs uh, um, uh, products that are coming out and showing exactly how and demonstrating how uh, Web3 really can help improve and, 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 and make scientific research way more efficient uh, and increase kind of those pipelines. So, so all of this, you know, uh, is coming together, I think, in kind of this next variation that we're exploring where OpSci is kind of built on these DSI primitives that are being built by multiple organizations out there, DSI Labs, uh, LabDAO, um, other folks out there. And OpSci is kind of moving more towards this Web3 open science society, right, where we're uh, basically taking, we're handling issues with identity and reputation, onboarding academics with their credentials, um, performing, linking, scholars and, and 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 the talent overflow in academia right all those great smart individuals with uh uh and, and, and passionate uh driven researchers with uh, opportunities to fund the research through scholarship and research and lastly incentivizing them to discover and publish reproducibly by uh basically submitting data sets that follow certain requirements for example the bit standard for neuroimaging data uh making sure that they verified their orchids so that they can cross list their uh DOIs on D site and D site in their ORCID and so on and so forth, and bridging together a kind of a closer interoperability between existing web services and using that as a way to onboard uh, scientists. At the heart of that are really impact certificates, which uh, I highly recommend checking out the um, uh, Funding the Commons series of talks on them uh, just this past June. Impact certificates are kind of like, uh, you can think of them as IP NFTs, but without the IP component, right, where it's, um, you could basically work on CC0 open access, uh, open source or open access uh, research and be able to actually generate some sort of funding to support you. So we're thinking about impact certificates on uh, two ends of the spectrum. One is funding the individual. So everyone who, and again, this is a concept in development. Uh, so we're still exploring the right way here. And if you have kind of any questions or input or would like to help guide the conversation or the development of this, please do reach out to me. Um, uh, where we can fund individuals by having them verify and, and onboard and import their academic credentials um, on, on the Decent Decentralized Science Identity Registry. They're verified with their holonym, and this mints them an impact certificate that they can use to be funded as an individual. So that impact certificate is going to be linked to metrics that are associated with their uh, off-chain and on-chain credentials. Uh, we're also looking at ways to mint impact certificates for fellowship projects that have a successful PR, for example, or for data sets that have been uploaded to commons, pass and validations for basic standards, uh, and maybe might have some associated cite, uh, citation metrics associated with like their DOI or their DCIT um, uh, identifiers. So kind of looking at it from both ends, where we want to fund individuals proactively, but also good, great impact-driven projects retroactively. It's an active area of research uh, on the horizon. 
So um, yeah, I want to say thank you for kind of listening. I want to hand it over to Nanak. Um, and uh, please do save your questions for the end, because I want to make sure he has enough time to take you guys through some of the really uh, on the ground, in depth, in the weeds work on uh, zero knowledge systems for private identity in Web3. Thanks, Shadi, for the presentation. Um, hi, I'm Nanak. Um, yeah, uh, that, yeah, that was a great presentation about OpsI. I've never seen it before. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be talking about Holonym. Uh, that's something you've been building for ID. Uh, so, so you know, we started with a, a DSI uh, related ID problem, which is in, actually I'll, I'll present the screen. Um, um, but yeah, um, <laughs> so we were looking at um, of how do you know who a scientist is on chain. So in the real world, the scientists are identified by their ORCID or Google Scholar or whatever credentials. But on chain, right, when we're building you know futuristic systems for putting scientific publications on a decentralized system, well, the only ID you have is your, your address. So you just have this uh, public key infrastructure. And so we're really interested in the question of what advantages can public key infrastructure bring DSI and ID in general? And also, like, what are the problems that are coming with, you know, blockchain is really making uh, PKI popular in uh, certain areas? And, and how do we mitigate those problems, right? So, you know, this one problem that we just mentioned about how do you know who a scientist is on chain when all you have is their address. So for that, we are bridging these OAuth tokens on chain. So if you ever hit like a sign with Google or sign with Orchid, then you have this sign token that's saying, here's your username, right? And it's signed by either Google, Orchid, whatever. And so that's essentially like a proof that you are who who you say you are if, if you have that token. Right, so we worked on verifying that on chain. And then also, because everything on blockchain is public, right, that, that's good for some use cases, but not for all. Like for, for DSI, that, that works very well because you need to know that somebody's actually an author of a paper. Everybody should be able to see that this address is really author of the paper. But for more sensitive accounts, like your Google account, for example, you, you don't want that. So we started exploring what uh, ZK could add to this type of credential system. And really what we encountered is ZK can, can fix a lot of the current issues in the identity climate. So right now, compliance, I mean, turning out cash in the news, and the values of Web3 seem to be at a clash with the government. and maybe there's a way to be compliant while still protecting these Web3 values. And we think if there is a way, then, then ZK will provide it. Um, so yeah, we're, we're working a little bit with Andrew Yang's DAO Lobby 3 to, to provide proof of people's residency without revealing uh, any personal information about them to anybody. So they need to make sure everybody is in the US if they're participating in political lobbying. So uh, we're, we're building some, some ZK tooling uh, with uh, BDQ as well to, to do that. So then there's another issue very related of civil resistance. So you have tools like Proof of Humanity and Bray ID that are necessary to vote on Gitcoin because quadratic voting is very prone to civil attacks. And another thing that's very prone to civil attacks is just voting in general. Um, even <laughs> blockchain consensus to a certain extent, and also airdrops, because farmers and bots will, will, will steal a lot of airdrops by pretending they're using the protocol. And one of the problems with uh, public key infrastructures is it's very easy to create a new public key. Uh, you can just spin up a new address really easily, and then you have a bunch of identities. So uh, it's really hard to ensure that, that one person is, is really one identity, and um, you know that this person doesn't have a bunch of different identities. 
So ultimately, that that's something that isn't a problem in traditional ID, because you have a government ID, you have a social security number. Now, uh, social security numbers are are <laughs> fraught with lots of issues, right? They're they're extremely predictable. They're only ten digits. And uh, actually, you can predict with uh, about 10% accuracy uh, for, for certain years using machine learning models uh, what somebody's social security number is just based on their uh, birth date and time and location. So um, obviously not, not the best number for, for many reasons, but they are unique to, to people. So um, traditional ID is, is very good for proving that somebody's unique. So a way to bridge these real life credentials in addition to the ORC IDs and um, you know web, web 2 credentials. Uh, it can help not only DSI but also the, the greater blockchain ecosystem. And one other nice thing about the real world ID that you don't have in blockchain is ambiguity. Because in blockchain if you lose your private key, there is no way of recovering your account because you know, in Web2 and the regular world, you can because you just need to show that you're yourself. You show that you're the same person who set up your bank account, for example. Um, and because there's a little bit of ambiguity in ID, like it's very hard to impersonate somebody else, but it can be done. It, it allows this type of um, like, OK, well, we can tell this person is um, the same person without their ID. I mean, without um, knowing you know, their password or, or, or private key. But in blockchain, it's like you lose your private key, there, there's no ambiguity. Like, it's just yes or no. If you have that, then you have your account. There, there's, there's no wiggle room for saying you're the same person. So uh, government ID, though, and also just like Web2 accounts can provide that if you, if you show your Web2 accounts, and that's how most websites do it. You have emails or phone numbers. You get a you know, password reset link, too. Uh, but then there's a privacy issue linking those to your address on chain. Uh, anybody can then see your linked accounts. So, so that's another place where, where ZK can come in. So we've been working on credential systems that allow you to merge all these different Web2 and real life identities into one uh, holistic ID identity called a hollow. And this hollow contains all your, you know, your ORCID account, your, uh, which can be public. Um, you know, some other accounts that you want to keep private. And it can also have like recovery conditions for your wallet. So then essentially uh, you have like this, this one root identity, uh, a smart contract, and it can, it can be used to either prove attributes about your sensitive information or just reveal some of your accounts or even uh, recover any private keys. And we'll talk a little bit more, more about how that works. Uh, so key recovery is has a lot of moving parts, right? So um, let's say you want to prove your identity by a fingerprint, by your Twitter account, your Google account, and also like your passport. So this would be a, a fairly rigorous uh, uh, set of things you need to recover your account. Then what you can do, um, I, you could also like threshold it, say like, okay, I just need two out of four of those. So what you can do is you store your private keys in lit protocol, and we're working on an interface to this. So lit protocol is a it's like a key storage and signing network, uh, and it gives you uh, it, it's decentralized, right? So instead of the key being stored at one place, it's stored up amongst a bunch of different nodes, and the nodes will all have consensus and, and give you the key if you meet some on chain conditions. Right, so here we have the on-chain conditions being a smart contract where you prove enough of your identities. So you prove enough of my, your identities, lit protocol will give you back your, your private key. And then, um, you know, uh, this is almost fully decentralized. Uh, but before it's there, there's one outstanding question, which is how do you commit to those accounts on chain. So you have all these, you know, your Google account, Twitter account, whatever. So we're exploring some uh, multi-polarity computation approaches to, um, right, because you want to make sure if you put these accounts on chain, nobody can see them. So you want them to be somewhat, uh, you know, you want the commitment to hide 
on the actual account. So by commitment, I mean like, you know, some value you put on chain that shows that, you know, it, it's linked to this account. It, 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 it's binding, so to speak, to this account, but it also hides what the account actually is. Uh, so then later you can prove you have the account without revealing uh, the account that it was committed to. Question is though, how to uh, commit to that account on chain uh, because one way to do it is you use some sort of secret in the commitment. Uh, however, the secret, if you lose it, then you can't recover it. And the whole point of this is to recover accounts. So we're, we're looking at like MPC research to, uh, to have a decentralized committee of nodes generate a secret based on your username. Uh, and, and this is definitely feasible. It's just uh, something that needs a little bit of engineering work. So another thing that we built is this uh, credential mixer, right? So think of it like uh, for IDs, you have this version of Tornado Cash, where instead of mixing money, you're 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 mixing IDs. So this allows this is how we put these government IDs on chain without uh, sacrificing privacy. It sounds kind of uh, like a paradox, but what happens is yeah, at first some centralized server can see your identity, and you know you are at first trusting them with the information, which is you know a, a bad thing. But then you put it in this mixer, so then they can never see your, your address. They just know this one person registered at this one point. They don't gain any new information because these people already have these government databases of identity. So they learn nothing about you, except that you interact with some service at a certain time. They don't know your address or anything. So this is how we think that KYC and uh, real life identity can be used with privacy on, on the blockchain. And, and this is this case that is only possible with, with blockchain. You kind of need this uh, global permissionless database to have this type of uh, uh, properties that, that make it really good for, for storing these uh, zero knowledge uh, uh, identity commitments. So yeah, um, you know, we, we started off uh, focusing solely on the DeFi space. So proving that scientists or a lab is, is what they say they are on chain. So uh, for, for DeSci marketplaces, uh, that's been a use case. And also now for Andrew Yang's, day, Andrew, Andrew Yang's DAO, um, we're working on proof of residency. So proving uh, without revealing information about them uh, that somebody's in the US in order to vote on proposals. And we're working on other partnerships too because we really think that this can be used for wallet recovery and uh, airdrops, especially. It can make it really hard to farm airdrops. Uh, we're also interested in, in voting, making sure that one person has one vote and kind of building new decentralized voting systems is, a, is an interest. Uh, it, it's a little bit more uh, ambitious, right? It's really hard to get a voting system secure um, and uh, it meets everybody's needs. So we're really mostly focused on, um, you know, wall recovery, airdrops, and verification. So you know that's like what we're doing with DSI, uh, verifying people's accounts publicly uh, on, on chain to prove stuff about their address. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna open it up for for questions to both Shadi and me. And yeah, you can, you can find us uh, on holonym.id or also by this QR code, which I think also points there. All right, yeah, and uh, thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks for the presentation, uh, Shadi and Nanak. I see John was the first one to have his hand up. So John, do you want to jump in? Sure, thanks. Um, this was great. Uh, I will say before my questions, your slides are freaking awesome. Whoever does your graphics is amazing. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, ZK is, uh, great for, for what you're building. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. My question goes back to what uh, Shadi was talking about with Opside, though, on a more philosophical level. You mentioned something about uh, the currency of science and how citation is kind of this currency of uh, science. And I'm curious uh, your thoughts on how the currency of science might operate or what the currency of science might be 
if impact certificates or something like impact certificates starts to emerge you know is it still going to be your science is good because it's cited or or what might that look like yes yeah, it's, it's actually kind of fast uh, a really really great question incredibly thought provoking uh like if we kind of look at the history of metrics and why certain ones were chosen versus others it comes down to funders that want to have great you know really good high resolution evaluation methods to figure out how to best allocate funding to to different maybe labs or, or groups or collaborations or proposals so so there is kind of i believe this kind of uh top down signal that comes during allocation of funds for science for basic science research that weights some metrics more heavily than others and so you know you've had different ones kind of emerge over the past uh what like 70 years or so that that i guess like citation's been kind of primarily used as a as a metric and i think with impact certificates the types of funders that can now participate in in, in funding impact-driven uh, science or impact-driven research, uh, it's gonna be more diverse. So that means also different outcomes that people are gonna be looking for. So for example, uh, a funder who is perhaps a philanthropic organization related to uh, perhaps Alzheimer's disease is going to perhaps be looking at a different set of metrics that matter to them in terms of impact, right? Uh, in terms of maybe like education, in terms of um, uh, in, in terms of therapeutics development, uh, in terms of like lifespan, average expectancy, that sort of stuff. So, so you might, I think, impact certificates could potentially set the stage for kind of like a free market discovery or like a convergence towards local minima of metrics that best facilitate the impact of the, that best facilitate the mission or that that best fulfill the impact of the organization that's providing the funding and so you might have multiple organizations kind of come up with their own impact metrics um, and that these might you know kind of compete with each other and the idea is that those organizations that are the most successful at raising money because they're actually having real impacts or uh speaking to the needs of of, of their constituents or whoever their donors are then those are the metrics that are eventually going to win out. So, so I think it's an optimistic take. Um, there's definitely a pessimistic take there, but I think maybe I'll leave it leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, uh, an open market of algorithms for funding. That sounds very interesting. Yeah, I think one of the the most powerful things about uh, impact certificates is that they can be cross. They're interoperable, right? Like the spec, so they can be listed on other secondary markets. And I think the main kind of like reason why you would want an impact certificate is say that you are the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, and you've been kind of allocated a certain amount of funding with a specific mandate. And you to maintain that funding, you kind of have to reach certain goals or criteria. So with these impact certificates, you can have these really high resolution um, numbers that tell you exactly how a data set's being used, right? Like you could. Uh, even compute like the amount of carbon that's being consumed in like the transmission of that data or that knowledge. So, so, so I think it's the, the creativity is the only thing that's kind of holding us back. Um, specifically, in thinking about how we parameterize impact, and it, it's just a really kind of exciting, I think, field that's just kind of getting off the ground uh, these past couple of years. And I'll just quickly plug that I know the proposal proposal in Burger Crew who's going to be presenting uh, towards the end of the month. They're trying to also think because uh, their tool is specifically to facilitate uh, different versions of the funding side of things and could potentially integrate with the kind of tools uh, that uh, Shadi and Nana presented on today. So yeah, excited to to get to hear more from that crowd later in the month. But Umar, I see you have your hand raised and. Yeah, if anyone else has any questions, uh, please feel free to either raise your hand or drop them in chat for now. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, hey, Shadi and Anna, great to see you guys here. Um, obviously, I think this uh, project's awesome. Um, I wanted to ask specifically, one, I guess I just want to check my understanding of Holonym, that you can like use it to basically prove who you are without giving away your data. And then secondly, um, as a as a use case for it, um, can that enable like things like um, anonymous peer review to be done 
uh, really well, and uh, especially to be done in a way that lets you like build a reputation from review to review. Uh, so in other words, like, does that anonymity kind of is is it is it somewhat persistent? Maybe more like pseudonymity than uh, anonymity. Uh, let me know if that makes sense or it doesn't. Yeah, that's a, a I really love that question. Um, so yeah, your understanding is correct, and uh, it it could uh, theoretically be be used to to do that. So um, we're kind of designing the the protocol with to to make use like that possible in in the long term, where you know you can have some sort of attributes that are I'll put in this um, ID and and the idea is also like that addresses that you use with that ID can't be linked, right? So, right, in blockchain, like you have an address and, you know, it's kind of pseudonymous, uh, but then you you send it, you send money from that to another address and then all these addresses are linked. Um, so, so really where the anonymity comes in is you don't link those addresses. So, yeah, you can have the same credentials on, on multiple addresses and, and those credentials can um, be used for, um, for example, like uh, anonymous peer review. Super cool. Um, and um, what kind of UI? I, maybe that's kind of far out, but I'm super curious. Um, would that be like for peer reviewers? Uh, yeah, I, I well, haven't maybe, thought maybe about the peer review UI. UI. I don't know, Shadi, if you have. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like it, it, would, it would take some time to to design. Uh, I, I think we can abstract away a lot of the difficulty, but sometimes it's it's hard to make it super easy with with the uh, UI for CK. Yeah, I think I think the key really concept here is that you know Hollow is a really kind of low level substrate for identity. So what we can do is let people create or mint these new um, uh, you know proof of identity like hey i'm an individual person i have like this root identity that you can't see the information about but i can take that identity and interact with any dap so so it'll be up to i think the dap developers and, and those that are kind of working closely with different peer review communities or academic communities that require peer review to to uh kind of hone in on how to best use use the tech i, I think there's going to be multiple iterations before we converge on uh the ideal flow or the ideal ui got it so it's more like an api um, if I'm understanding right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Umar. Yep, that's right. It's a, it's a set of smart contracts that you can interact with. Yep. John, do you want to jump in next? I'm trying. There we go. Hey. Uh, so with the uh, with holonym, does this do the are the identities dot tied to uh, my actual personhood or can i have multiple or are they tied to the actions that a holonym um performs so like can i as an individual have like if i'm both a researcher and engineer have my researcher holonym that has all my records and credentials for being a researcher and then my engineer identity that has all the the credentials for being an engineer and all my achievements there uh, or is it really, really it, it's just supposed to one person, one NIM sort of thing? You want to take that, Anak? Um, yeah, I, I guess I'll take that one. So, so the idea is that you have a hidden or shielded uh, uh, root identity. And so with this root identity, you can do things like um, associate claims, log in with your Google account, sign the, J the JWT, uh, verify your proof of residence. And you can mint individual uh, kind of tokens that represent these credentials. And uh, these are deposited into a, a credential mixer. And you can create any arbitrary account, uh, you know, pull up MetaMask, create a new account, and then withdraw that credential to that account, right? So, so that credential doesn't say anything, perhaps, except that you are an engineer and that you do have a bachelor's degree and that you are certified by the Society of Engineers. And that's it. Um, you could perhaps mint uh, a different type of credential that says different things. 
and withdraw that to a different account. Um, but for the smart contracts that are interacting on the back end that are doing checks for civil resistance or that are ensuring kind of like the uniqueness of multiple accounts, they'll be able to say, hey, these two accounts are actually the same person, but they won't know exactly what's, um, besides what you've shared, they won't know exactly what's, um, uh, not that they're the same person, but they are both corresponding to one individual person, right? Um, so, so there is some degree of separation between the root identity and the pseudonymous personas that you can create. Uh, I think it's still possible to link the pseudonymous personas together through on-chain uh, looking at interactions on chain, but uh, maybe either Chris or Nanak or Caleb, I don't know if you guys want to chime in on that too. Yeah, um, yeah, I think uh, Nanak's connection cut out, but um, yeah, that's a good question. And so for the, there are, I guess, two answers to it. And one is with public hollows, um, yeah, you would be able to create sort of two identities one or as many as you want um but then with the zk identity there's like a level of uh abstraction beyond that so if you wanted you could just have all of your credentials private the whole time and it's not and none of them are actually linked to any um link to any id ever except when you want to link it so like like shadi said um if you want to prove that you are a member of a certain society or something you could do that without sharing your orchid or your gmail or twitter or anything like that it's interesting i wonder what this will do for um privacy and, and protecting people who might be doing stuff that is um, uh, deemed un, unfit by certain authority figures. So, you know, people who might want to publish Bitcoin or or publish a, a article about uh, a state that they are part of. So I think there's a lot of potential to this. It's really cool. Yeah. Hey, guys. Yeah, I, I think I could also chime in. Uh, and this kind of ties back to 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 um, Umar's question as well as uh, of what this UI might look like if you're trying to maybe prove certain things about yourself, like if, if you want to prove your engineering uh, credentials compared to your other these these other interests that you have. Um, so one thing that, that we're looking at uh, uh, is kind of like a UI where it's, where it's kind of like a point and click for generating these proofs. Um, so let's just say that you want to enter some some new society that you know, where, where you essentially only want to reveal certain pieces of information about yourself, you can essentially just, you know, in, in a dialog box, just kind of like click these things they want to prove about yourself and then uh, that'll generate a proof. So, so ideally it would look very, like you would, you have like all the identities in front of you that, 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 you, that, that you can prove and then you can select a few very easily uh, and then just reveal those. That's absolutely right. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right, Chris. Uh, kind of similar to the flow for the new Gitcoin Passport version that just came out. Um, so yeah, I think there's kind of, the, the field's kind of converging upon some similar UI uh, use cases. So I have a question for you guys. Um, what are some of the most immediate kind of gut reactions or reflexes that you have with identity on chain? Like for example, would you feel comfortable using a system like Hollow uh, with certain types of credentials? And in what cases would you feel uncomfortable? Because identity is incredibly intimate, right? And um, like it's been interesting to see kind of Stripe and Persona and these other KYC services emerge where they just like scan your picture, scan your face, and it goes on some centralized server. And people don't usually ask questions. Um, so I'd be kind of curious to know what your what your reactions are. Yeah, Brian, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. That's an interesting question. Like, as an administrator for shared spaces, I actually find the use of shared identity in certain situations to also be very useful. In other words, um, it's a single account, a single identity, but multiple people, multiple people have access to that identity, and that's an interesting use case. Um, kind of in the opposite direction of what you're saying, though. But I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. 
like very much the account that I'm signed into right now, <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wait, your name's <laughs> yeah. not Media and Communications? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to break it to you guys. <laughs> I'll jump in if no one else has a has a thought here. Uh, I, personal identity on the blockchain scares the crap out of me, to be frank, because it is just a public ledger of information. Uh, everything you put there is permanent and immutable. If you screw something up, if you post the wrong thing, you can't get rid of it. And people will always be able to find out who you are, which is why I think zero knowledge is incredibly important to a lot of this stuff so that people can, you can get verified for some things without having your, without doxing yourself, right? So it's, in its current state, it's very scary. I know with some of the projects we uh, I work with, we take personal information, we remove it before we put any data related to that information on the blockchain, because if we put that up there, we're it's just immoral and legally dubious. <laughs> So uh, I do very much appreciate what's being built with zero knowledge products like yours. Yeah, and I know we're hitting time, but I'll just give a, a plus one to John's response because I know we're uh, both at the on the one hand very excited about these kinds of tools, while on the other hand being very cognizant of the permanence of some of this information and not wanting to create permanent records people can't uh, get out of in the future if they wanted to. Um, but yeah, thank you, Shadi and Nanak and the rest of the OpSci crew for stopping by today. Uh, it was really great to hear, really appreciate it. We'll definitely let you know once this uh, video gets posted. And yeah, just thank you to everyone who joined and spent part of your Thursday with us. I hope everyone has a good rest of your day. And if you are free now, please feel free to jump into the Scurf Discord. Uh, for a, conver a coffee house chat that John was mentioning earlier. So yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks again, Shadi and crew.